All right. Hello, everybody. Matthew Hagan, we're back again. I don't even know what episode this is. <laughs> or I shouldn't say episode. What am I saying? I feel like it's TV. No, we're back again for another <laughs> Lyceum at the Accounting Alchemy Network. We have an amazing guest with us today. And before I pass it over to Ingrid to introduce who our guest is, I just want to remind you all who we are and what we stand for and a few bullet points to kind of guide you on your journey. So again, remember, we are the Accounting Alchemy Network. We are a grassroots movement, a community of individuals across the globe now who are really interested in helping accounting professionals understand the power that they have to create positive change in the world. What that means in another way is really helping accountants and the, cl the clients that accountants serve understand how they can prioritize people and planet over profit. So we have a lot of resources for our community out there. There's a whole YouTube channel with a bunch of Lyceums. If you're not familiar with this community and you're for the first time finding us online, uh, particularly in the YouTube channel, you'll notice somewhere down below, there's a link that has our website. Go there, sign up for our newsletter. That's like step number one as a community member. And then from there, begin your journey. Join us at our events, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have questions about how to get more involved, we also have an onboarding a um, booklet or a guide, a playbook, if you will, um, that we've created to help new members acclimate themselves to the possibilities that they have in entering into this work as advocates for a better future. So um, with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Ingrid, who's going to introduce our guests, and we'll get this conversation rolling. Over to you, Ingrid. Thank you, Matthew. I am so excited that we have Paula Kensington with us today. Paula was introduced to me by Christine McDougall, who is another one of our fantastic Australian Lyceum guests um, who we got talked with us last year or year before about her wonderful organization, Centropic World. And she's like, you've got to meet Paula Kensington. She's doing some great, amazing things with accounting professionals in Australia and the UK. And yeah, I was so excited when you and I met Paula and right away you invited me to one of your calls, which being in Australia, it was starting at midnight for me here on the West Coast of the United States. And I'm so glad that I stayed up to participate in that because it was a lot like one of our social forum lyceums, except that you had people represented from like a dozen countries or something. And the conversation was just off the chain, fantastic, of accounting professionals from all over the world talking about how we can shift and change some of this. So I'm so excited to be diving in with you today to discuss disrupted business models and explore into what might be possible in a world that needs business to be better. And before we do that, I would love it if you can give us a little bit more um, introduction to yourself, your background, those sorts of things. Sure. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for uh, the very warm welcome. Um, it's 8 a.m. here in Sydney and I've got my cup of tea, my mug of tea. So this is the first thing that I've done since walking the dogs this morning. Um, so it's great to be here and I'm excited. I'm energized to have a conversation about doing better business um, for all stakeholders, not just shareholders. Um, I'm a true financial professional. Uh, left school at 16, actually, never wanting to be an accountant um, because my late father was an accountant and my older brother is an accountant. And the last thing I wanted to be was a boring old accountant. But it turns out that I wasn't a boring old accountant. Um, and, you know, I, I've been through the ranks of all of the accounting uh, roles. I started off life in my first accounting job writing checks and we didn't have computers. So I am actually that old. Um, it's just a really, really good filter. Um, and, you know, I worked my way up through the ranks of finance and I ended up in Australia uh, with my first CFO role about oh, 20, almost 20 years ago. Um, so they say it's the land of a, of a lucky country. And it certainly was for me. Um, I got my my opportunity to be a CFO and I've been a CFO for ASX, public listed businesses, private businesses multinational businesses. So I've kind of seen a lot of various um, size of business and complexity of business. Um, and then I actually won a CFO of the Year Award in 2013 um, by Thomson Reuters. And at that stage, I realized I wanted to be more than the CFO. I wanted to be able to make change across the whole of the business. And I've also then was working with a lot of CEOs that were kind of 
a little bit light on leadership. And some of my role as CFO was being having to navigate um, directors, board directors and founders who were arguing, men who were arguing about, you know, their own sort of power trips. And I just thought, God, is this, if this is my job. Like this is, you know, this is not something that I want to do. So um, I left corporate world um, five years ago and set up my own business. So I do CFO advisory for smaller businesses. So now I get to run my own business, which is even more challenging than running a huge public listed business, I can assure you. <laughs> um, but I also help small businesses who are going through an M&A transaction or they suddenly realize that they need a little bit more smarts around the financial aspects of their business. They kind of get to a size where they suddenly realize that it matters. But in that five years that I've been out on my own, I've also then started to think about what does better business mean? Because I, I've seen the bad and the really bad and the really ugly and a little bit of good, but a lot of bad um, conversations in the boardroom that, you know, would would they people would hate to think that um, that was getting any airtime outside of the boardroom. But, you know, some really bad actions for for other stakeholders, including nature, which wasn't even considered Five, more than five years ago no one no conversation in the boardroom was thinking about nature and now I look back and I think my god like what 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 is wrong with us anyway we'll get into that in a minute um so so now I sort of think about regenerative so I've been on my own personal growth journey um I've and I've written two papers I've called them green papers um because of the environmental nature but I've written them not only to educate, help educate other finance leaders, but to also help me to get my understanding um, consolidated. There's nothing better than writing about something that you're learning about to, to test your understanding of the subject. So, so I've written two papers um, and I have done some work around what does regenerative mean, um, working with Christine McDougall on what does syntropic mean. Um, and so here I am, thinking about now, how do we change the system? How do we change the commercial system? So not just a world in accounting speak, but you know, the big business as well. Um, so you know, we know that we have to do better. Um, and I think finance, to be honest, is a big generalization, but finance are like 10 years behind where that we need to be. Hmm. And I was talking to someone the other day and he said I was being generous. He thought the finance community was 20 years behind where it should be. <laughs> So if that's true, we haven't got another 10 years to kind of get better. We kind of have to do a bit of fast forward now and learn quick. It's a bit like eating an elephant. You know, you've got to eat it in small chunks, but really fast. <laughs> that's funny. Well, thank you for that introduction, um, Paula. And I guess I want to kind of go back for a moment because you so 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 as you were sharing your story, I was like, yay, you made it to the other side, right? Like the journey, the transformation. Mm -hmm. Uh, towards becoming a regenerative accounting professional. And that's something that we talk about at the Accounting Alchemy Network. And one of the journeys that we are inviting people to embark on is becoming a regenerative accounting professional. Um, and so that's exactly what you did, right? Like, and, and, you, and, and I love that you wrote these green papers and I, I would love to maybe put a spotlight on them. And, and certainly if we can share them with our communities, that'd be awesome. Um, but I would love to kind of go back a little bit um, and understand maybe through the form of a story or an example of like what 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 you know what is something that you saw that maybe woke you up a little bit right it, or or a moment where you realize okay I can no longer tolerate this I need to change course and and granted it might have been a gradual thing but I'm I'm just kind of curious like what that moment was for you when you realized that you actually needed to, to, to focus on this in your career. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, when I worked for a major international um, property business, I'll put it that way, um, in Australia, that's head, head office out of London on the FTSE 100, um, that was a toxic environment. Um, really toxic. I remember sitting in Australia and we didn't have a head of operations. So I said to my CEO who was in Australia, look, as CFO stroke COO, I want to um, help run the operations. We had 12 people that were basically selling office space. And 
the directive for London was um, a stick approach. You know, they've got to have 50 calls a day. They've got to convert, you know, 25 percent of those calls. You know, how difficult is it? If they don't meet up to these standards, these metrics, then they're out. We'll find other people. I, like, literally, that was how they saw the business and probably still do so today. And I, I didn't want to do business like that. I said, no, these are people. These 12 people need to be held and understood. And they're not accountants. They're not finance people. These are people selling office space. So I said, I want to get to know these 12 people. I want to have at least an hour with each of them. I want to understand what are their drivers so that I can help them do their best work. Okay, sure, we've got targets, but it was almost that sort of umbrella approach. I was shielding them from the beast above and helping them to be their best. And my CEO said to me, Paula, you haven't got time for that. And I thought, my God, that's it. Like I ended up doing it on the quiet, but I was like, this is bullshit. Like I can't work like this. You know, I want to help people be their best. That is not getting the best out of anybody. So that that was 2016. And that was my first realization that I can't work in an environment like this. Um, I then went on to another ASX local software business that had three directors that were feuding, literally feuding. Mm. Two weeks into that job, I had to have a conversation with the chair of the board who said, these two guys can't be together. Like literally they were trying to get me um, off the fence because as a CFO, you have to be impartial, right? You have to kind of have ethics, which we do have strong ethics and I can't be won by the CEO or the COO. Like, you know, I want to do the best for the business. And it's almost like the CFO is the only person that feels like they're doing the best for the business, not because everyone else has got a personal agenda. So I just thought like, you know, again, is my job stopping these two directors from trying to kill each other or am I actually trying to do something good here, you know? And mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I guess those yeah. two events really led yeah. me to wanting to do better. Yeah, that makes sense. And 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 I'll acknowledge we have a, a question in, in the chat, so we'll, we'll entertain that in just a moment. But I want to kind of observe something. Um, and, and that is that it, it seemed like what you were in, what you were, pointing to in the first story was the the lack of humanity in a way of like of the of the workplace and and your your desire to to take all but one hour of their time <laughs> right to actually build a relationship and have a conversation with them and get to know them was viewed as um uh, an uh, uh, like an extraction of a of, of a limited resource that is your time and it's not worth the money right it was sort of it sounds like the undertone to a lot of that and it's um yeah i mean a lot of people i think are, are are in you know in those situations where you know we're no longer at least in in this community we're no longer interested in tolerating any of that inhumane behavior and that's one of the components of this work. I mean, you know, I think I think a lot of people think like, oh, okay, how does being a regenerative accountant translate as helping my clients? Yeah. Well, sometimes it's not about helping the clients. Sometimes it's actually about changing the culture internally so you create a more humane workplace for your fellow colleagues. Oh, yeah, that's right. And so part of my path now is to help educate other people like me to say that that's not good enough. And mm -hmm. I'm not standing for that and helping them feel empowered to have that conversation. Because when you're in big business, you can feel really small if you're the only voice that's kind of calling out the CEO saying that behavior is not right. Yeah. And people yeah. need to feel that they're supported by saying, no, this is, you know, this is not right. And, and so that feels like if I can reach, I was saying to Ingrid a couple of weeks ago, if I can reach 3 million accountants worldwide, to get them to think about doing better business, then, you know, I'll die happy kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I love that. I, I mean, we're very much on the same mission here. So I'm so glad we found each other. <laughs> and there are <laughs> others out there who are, are hearing about what we're doing and joining the mission. And, you know, just like you were saying, in a lot, especially in the larger firms, being the only one with the voice for change Mm -hmm. ends up getting us singled out as being a troublemaker, a boat rocker, you know, those sorts of things. And it reminds me of one of my favorite Joe Woodard quotes. Joe once said something along the lines of one step ahead, you're a leader, two steps ahead, you're a visionary, 
three steps mm. ahead, you're a martyr. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why we started the Accounting Alchemy Network is so that we can do this together. Because if any one of us is the lone wingnut coming out with these ideas on our own, we're going to get laughed out of the room, <laughs> if not yeah. stoned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had, um, so that first example I gave you, I was in, so the, the global CEO or COO came over, like the big, big honcho came over and sat with me and my boss in the room and we went through why the business wasn't performing, all right? Um, and my boss was lying and I had to call him out. And that's not the first time I've called out my boss in front of a board or in front of his boss. And and I don't know whether that's a career limiting move, but I'm just not prepared to have someone lie about something important, you know, when I can, I've got to stand up. Like if I don't say anything, it makes me as bad as he is. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, and I think that that brings us to Liz Farr's fantastic question in the chat. You mentioned the changes that you're starting to see in boardroom conversations. Would you say that those are the results of generational changes or something else? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say the the change in, in the conversation is brought about by people that are caring about our future. And I think there's more people now that care about our future and the damage that we're doing to our future. And I think that is now becoming a bit of a tidal wave to bring that conversation into the boardroom. Um, and whether that's coming from internally or whether that's coming from our customers or even maybe our investors, I think the investors may be a bit behind. But, you know, I think bringing about change and thinking about impact is coming from within for people that care. But also, you know, I think regulation is starting to have some positive change because now it's mandatory to actually be better I mean, maybe in small ways, but anyway, I think there's change coming in from outside and from inside. So I think that's bringing about a different conversation at the boardroom. And maybe people are being more courageous. Let's hope. I'd love to, I'd love to think that that's what's happening. Yeah. yeah. Um, go ahead, Ingrid. Oh, I was just going to kind of kick off our, our kind of the, the main core question that we're sort of gathering around is this acknowledgement that financial professionals need to, yeah, work within our current structures and frameworks, at least to an extent until we can change some of those structures and frameworks to bring about these systemic shifts. Mm. So how do we make these changes, these earth critical transitions for small, medium and large corporations recognizing that each of those business scales have very different needs? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a few things I talk about disruptive business models, and that feels like that could be a real tangible place to start because we've got exterior pressure challenging us to be better through regulation. But then what interior pressure do we have to challenge us to be better? So I feel like even if we, um, you know, the regulation is coming in at different pace for different countries, for different size of business. Um, and that's, well, that's not good enough in my opinion, but anyway, it is what it is. So we have to, in, 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 from an internal perspective, start challenging the way that we look at our business models. Because I say to people, it's great to have regulation. It's great to have international sustainability standards. It's great to start thinking like that. But if our internal business model and business thinking doesn't change, then nothing is actually going to change. And what I was starting to think about now is the, the inputs and the way the measures that we start to put our business models together. So whether you're an SME or a big enterprise or maybe a smaller business might be easier. But I think when we look, you know, when I think back to my days as CFO, every business decision was, OK, show me the business case. So when you take a business case and we've got $10 million of future cash flows and then we bring that back to a discounted rate and we suddenly say oh this is worth you know five million dollars to us now that discount rate well two things should we be discounting a project that adds value or should we be compounding that is a project over 10 years of 10 million dollars is that project actually worth more 
if we do it today, not less for the for the nature, for the impact it's going to have. So that's question number one. Question number two is the, the, the discount rate that we use. So we use a term called the weighted average cost of capital, the WAC, you know, and I started thinking about this. How do we bring in a cost of the impact into that WAC calculation? Because if you can remember your, your days in um, university or professional studies, you have to bring in a beta value. And that beta value is recognizing the risk of the market, you know, and that reduces your cash flows because of the risk of the market that you're in. But where's the risk of the planetary risk? So could we think about bringing some kind of planetary risk um, calculation into our business cases? And if we did that, then that would suddenly give us a different outcome when someone goes to the CFO and says, can I spend $10 million on X? There, there will be a different conversation than the one that's probably currently going on. Um, mm. And so I'm actually talking to CFOs in big business, in big global business, because I want to understand how do they do that? Because, you know, you, you might be fam familiar. I don't know what it's like in the US, but I think it's similar to what Australia is doing. Like, there's the international sustainability standards, which are the gold class standard. And then every jurisdiction gets to choose how much of that they want to roll out in their own countries. And so Australia is taking a carbon only, climate only part of that sustainability standard. So that's pretty bad, I think. Like, we're going to have to get to the gold standard. Why don't we just go there straight away and have a transition to it? Um, but anyway, so we're going to take this light approach. And I think the US is similar. And and so that's not going to work when you do business outside of Australia. So if you're in a global business, you're going to have to go straight to the gold standard anyway. Mm. And if you're in an SME that says, oh, it doesn't matter to me, I'm a non-reporting entity, you go, well, it does. Because if you're doing business with any of those multinationals, you're going to get caught up in their supply chain and you're going to have to report to them. Okay, not report to the regulator, but mm. you're going to have to report to your customer effectively. Yeah. So anyway, that was a, a big, long way of answering that question. <laughs> yeah, perfect. And it, it brings up a couple of different things. And, and so I guess I, I, so I'm, I have three things I want to put on the table. And one of them is a, actually a comment uh, and a question from Jason Knoll. So we'll answer. We'll address that last in this sequence. Mm -hmm. um, but I think something that comes up for me. Uh, so you, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase this in perhaps a slightly different way. Paula, do you know the definition of insanity? <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah exactly right what is it what is it you tell me it, the same what... thing expecting a different result <laughs> exactly and so so I get curious about about that um inquiry um because I because you mentioned earlier you're talking about things we learned in school and like things things we kind of carried with us into the industry um you know that we were taught by institutions saying this is you know this is what we've been doing for x many years and this is the standard and so now go forth and apply the standard right and then you come out into the marketplace and you're like yeah but your standard doesn't uphold anything about the climate so how is that the standard right so so i'm curious um maybe if you can talk a little bit about you know what you see because it is a it is a a, a, an issue that's I think caused from early education and, and, and standards that get set fairly early on like how do you imagine us and actually I'm going to point back to what you said earlier about you know we're 10 plus years behind in some regards in the fine how what what does it look like in your view to like completely turn the wheel right and 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 point this ship in a completely different direction. And and what are who are what are some of the institutions or yeah. or practices that you think really need to shift in order to get out of this insanity loop that we find yeah. ourselves? Yeah, yeah, and that's a great question, and it's something that I've actually been working on in the last couple of months. So I was on the for the governing council of ACCA. So ACCA is the Association of Chartered and Certified Accountants globally. So 250,000 members, I don't know, 600,000 students. So it's the largest global accounting body. And I was on their council for six years. And I feel that the accounting profession is in a state of overwhelm. I actually think it's lost its way. Now, that's pretty provocative to say, but I think it's lost its way because 
it is based on, I mean, it's glacial, like it's a hundred years old and is it fit for purpose? I don't know. You know, it's worried. It's, it seems to be driven by a student pipeline. Hmm. And I'm saying that's not good enough. We actually need a total about turn. And I'm now following the work of the International Federation of Valuing Impact. So the IFVI, which is out of Europe. And it's a conglomerate of really smart change makers that came out of places like Harvard and other business schools. And they've got together and it's being watched by the OECD and the UN. Um, and have a look at impact, the impact management platform. So it's a whole ecosystem of impact management, impact reporting, impact measurement. And I responded with a colleague of mine to an exposure draft at the end of last year about impact accounting. And I was really curious about why the accounting professions aren't in the ecosystem. Like this is their breakfast that we're, that we're eating. So why are you not there? And so I went back to ACCA strategy team and said, hey, why are you not responding to this exposure draft? And they said it wasn't on their priority list. And it's like, so there's little old Paula Kensington in her kitchen in Sydney, Australia, that is bothered to respond, but you haven't got the priority. It's a bit like the example I gave around big business. So, okay, I see big business can't move quickly, but I would have thought this is this is future proofing the accounting profession. So anyway, I then went to CAANZ and I went to IFAC. So the International Federation of Accounting body, like, you know, this is the pinnacle of all accountants. I went to them and I know one of their directors who's also Sydney based and I know the ex-president who is Sydney based. And I said to those two ladies, this is what's going on. Do you know this is what's going on? And they're like, oh my God, thank you so much for bringing it to my attention. I'm gonna to talk to the IFAC board next time we meet. Mm. So uh, probably not answering exactly your question, but there are other players that are really disrupting in a really positive way. And I think the accounting profession, if it doesn't catch up or it doesn't look at this, then it could get really disrupted. Yeah, I heard. And we'll, we'll get to Jason's question next, but I just wanna highlight something you said to kind of summarize um, and reflect back on how we, one of the things that we advocate for here at the Accounting Alchemy Network um, is, you know, of course we invite people to come into this space, build community, get educated, go through things like the Game Changer Intensive and, and really educate themselves on what's going on in the world and then watch our web, our Lyceums, et cetera. Um, but then of course we want them to go out into the world and talk to people because I think what, what, what you're highlighting for me is um, you actually played a really critical role in in ensuring that something did get seen and did get heard. And I think we we oftentimes rely on the institutions like, oh, they'll take care yeah. of it. They're, they're yeah, going to for sure. For it, sure. Right? And that's yeah. just not true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I thought that I thought, well, you know, will it matter whether Paula Kensington from her kitchen in Sydney responds or not? And and I you know. I'd like to think that actually it did matter. And what I did about telling the three accounting professional bodies about it was actually probably more powerful than the response that I gave. And I so we can't, we can't assume that someone else has got it. And I think that's a great point. Yeah. We have to be the change that we want to see and we have to we have to go for it. You know, and when I did my study last year, I did the eight week course at the Cambridge University of Sustainable Leadership. And we had to do a project um, over that eight week course. We had to come back and actually pick a business to do this real live project on. So I picked a local business. Actually, it's an Australian business, but it's global. So I, I chose them. And when I came back out of that session, I emailed the CFO locally and said, hey, this is what I've been doing. Are you interested? And I got crickets, nothing. So then I went onto social media, onto LinkedIn, and I put it out on LinkedIn. I said, hey, this is what I've been doing. And it's been so much fun and I've learned so many things. And then I tagged the CFO and the business. And guess what? I suddenly got a response. Mm -hmm. So I don't care about public shaming. Like, 
we haven't got time to mess around. Like we just have to go, you know, and I'm being respectful, of course, but I think there's an element of just being um, a bit of bravado. And maybe it's because I'm now in my fifties. I, I don't give a shit. <laughs> Well, there's public shaming and then there's inviting people into the conversation with yes. a level of accountability. Yes. Yes. Okay. Like we're not so down is... for cancel culture. Yeah, and at yeah. the same time, see, seeing someone on an email is keeping them in the loop and inviting them to join the conversation in, I think, a positive way. And I would say that, you know, like you said, little old Paula Kensington responding to this from her kitchen, does it make a difference? The, res the answer to that is absolutely yes. That is one of the main and only things that really makes a difference. We can't be relying on our leaders and legislators to be making these changes because they are actively benefiting from maintaining the unsustainable status quo. This kind of change happens when people come together and form a movement, which is what we are doing here in this conversation and in the Accounting Alchemy Network, which kind of brings us to Jason Knoll's question in the chat, he says, I love the idea that taking on a project today can actually have greater value than waiting. You said something like that earlier. And he says he's curious, what are some of the elements you would include to show this? Where have you seen that demonstrated and how? Yeah, so I haven't seen it in real life yet, but I think it's about the impact. If we can say that, you know, this five million dollar project is going to create this social impact um, uplift then then it has to be worth you know the the add-on um, impact effect of that for a society um, you know I think the work that um, I've got a client that works in Papua New Guinea and they do work in you know I mean it's a seriously developing country um, they're bringing hospital equipment to um, you know, to hospitals that don't have ultrasounds or, you know, some kind of pretty standard um, hospital equipment that probably developed countries are, you know, throwing away. So you imagine that project of the impact that you're having, the lives that you're saving, the health benefits of that, you know, wouldn't that be awesome to have a value of that? And I think what we're getting to with impact accounting um, is being able to get a factor of the of the happiness and, and of the societal benefit. So the IFR, IFVI, so the International Federation of Valuing Impacts, has got another exposure draft out for adequate wages. And so in that, and I'm happy to share the link with you after, in that report, it says that there's indexes around the world around the benefit of giving people the adequate above the the adequate wage you know so there are indexes that we could point to that says this project is going to have this positive impact so i want to bring that into my business case as an example but you know we will yeah. see more of those examples well and another example um that we learn about in the game changer intensive the course that we often take through the pachamama alliance that we roll out there training their activist training through the accounting alchemy network they talk about how um the critical tipping point where a movement has an impact in the greater world mm. is only around three and a half percent that it only takes three and a half percent of a population getting actively involved in a movement whether that be you know calling marching um you know writing to their their legal representatives whatever um to, to their their governmental representatives, whatever the case might be, taking some kind of active role in a movement before it really starts to catch on. People really notice and then they say, oh, maybe we need to be paying attention to this and things really start taking off. That's how in the United States anyway, um, the 14th Amendment was ratified. That's how women got the right to vote. Like there's there's layers and layers of you know demonstrating, showing how this can work. So I guess tossing the question out there of, so how many accountants are, are in the world internationally? What is three and a half percent of that? What would it look like to get three and a half percent of accounting professionals involved in these conversations? Well, and that's where I got my um, big, hairy, audacious goal of reaching three million accounting professionals. Um, I think I Googled it at that stage, and there's not actually as many as you think. I think there might only be you know, sort of 5 million accountants 
globally, which feels like maybe that's qualified accountants. I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, I think if I take my three million that I want to get to, I think we did the maths before, wasn't it? Like we just needed a hundred thousand or something like that. I'm not entirely so. I, so I think one of the tricky things is is there's certified public accountants, particularly in the United States, and then there's also accounting professionals who are not certified public accountants. So in the U.S., we have enrolled agents, licensed tax preparers, and consultants, and we also have management accountants. So bookkeepers offering client accounting solutions um, that don't do tax or audit and are not certified public accountants, but maybe. Um, certified QuickBooks or Zero advisors or, you know, other levels. Accounting yeah. is really broad. Well, and many of those people are not chartered accountants. Yeah. So maybe the ecosystem is finance professionals. Yeah. Whether that's qualified by experience or qualified by, um, you know, professional education or either. But yeah, that would be the ecosystem of accountants. And maybe that's more like... I don't know, 50 million or something like that globally. Well, and then financial professionals, we also get financial advisors, economists, bankers. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so all of these professions are inextricably interwoven and yet they have a siloed into yes. these professional categories. Yeah, where... yeah. but also they think differently. Yeah. And, I th and I was talking to a lady out of the UK that's got a impact measurement tool and so she's been talking to investment bankers and the investment community and that she's realized. So she's an engineer by trade. She's realized that actually the investment community is very different to the finance community, which is very different to the banking community. So there are, you know, we might sort of come under a similar umbrella of finance professionals, but we do actually do quite different things and and think about money in different ways. So I guess with that, what when looking at things in different ways, what new policies, particularly policies around our finances, our capital reserves, um, what that might what might that look like for businesses as far as what do we need to measure differently and calculate differently to be able to produce the new outcomes that we are seeking to create? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm sort of playing with this framework now around what does a regenerative capital policy look like um which i think is like the nirvana but there's a few steps that we can take to get there so what i suggest is we look at our reserves and rather than just doing more of the same with 80 percent of our reserves why don't we try and think about could we actually just maximize 50 percent of our reserves doing more of the same and 50% of our reserves to actually do different, you know, something different. So it could be something that's that's sort of along those lines that says rather than um, making the you know the huge step uh, and changing the way that we do things, can we can we ring fence 50% of our retained earnings to invest in projects that are going to have a positive or have a so a society or environmental impact and not a financial impact. So I think, you know, we're, we're very driven by that short termism um, around the quarterly results and the shareholders, if you're publicly listed or, you know, does your investor need, um, you know, um, the, the returns, you know, on, on a short term basis. But how do we think about keeping some of that going whilst we're then having a more longer term approach on, you know, say 30% say of our retained earnings, we're gonna actually invest in these three projects that have these criteria. And the bottom criteria is a financial one. You know, now I see people talk about their quarterly return, their quarterly results, and it's all about EBITDA and, and 10X this and whatever, whatever. And I now are putting out on the chat, what about the impact? Tell me about the impact that you're having. I don't care about the financial impact that you're having. Great. Like we know that you're kind of going to spout that out and whatever, whatever. But what really matters, and I think this is about changing the conversation, it's really about tell me about the impact first. Tell me the finances later. Yeah. Um, so I want to highlight something um, that came up earlier, and then I want to ask a, a, a very practical question, I think, perhaps. Um, so one of the things that you know we were you and Ingrid were sort of riffing on on 
the spectrum of accounting finance professionals and 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 yes there is there there is sort of a distinction in terms of who who does what and what their role is and such and and yet one of the things that i think we are observing um as the common thread throughout is this idea of of who's stewarding the money stories right like what what are what are those narratives that whether you're a financial advisor helping an individual to make decisions about how they spend their or, 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 or how they invest their resources, or you're a, a CFO sitting down with a business owner helping them to figure out um, what to do after having presented their financial statements. There, there's behind that is a set of beliefs and values um, that you know that 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 is the 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 belief about what money is and how it shows up in our lives and what it mean what it means to be valuable even and and what gets valued and so that sort of leads me to this question it's you know it's sort of like this idea of that the you know the the heart and lungs of the earth are not included in the spreadsheets right so um so so at the accounting alchemy network one of the things that we're very concerned with is like the pr practical solutions right so so how do you inject this new breath and air um into into this this conversation about spreadsheets and and actually make it mean something on a very tangible practical day-to-day -day level yeah well i think i think we can and if i think back to my spreadsheets around you know the revenue the income and what's the cost of all of that generating that income like why don't we put at the top you know the value what is the value of this project and if we put it front and center in our spreadsheets we might not know the answer and it might not be the right answer but it's got a place it's got a it's got a row or it's got a column i mean i think the problem is that there's so much value of the of the greater commons and and nature and everything else that you know we just don't value well, we do as humans, but we don't actually really think, oh, well, that's got no monetary value. So, you know, it's a difficult question, but I think as a simplistic place to start is put a row in your spreadsheet that says the value impact of nature, of society, of the environment, and, and start listing as a, a finance professional, what could be some of those impacts? Because mm. it's about us getting curious. We don't know and we probably can't even measure but if we include it with a with a blank spot it will remind us every time we look at our business model that we haven't included nature yet and so you know depending on the size of the business um yeah there might be teams that are already thinking about this and if there are great then we can get them involved if there aren't then it's our responsibility to, to talk to the leadership team when the CEO says, what the hell is that in my spreadsheet? Like, what are you talking about? Well, you know, it, it's a discussion topic, you know, and I think it's about having that discussion because not only should it be in our spreadsheets, but it should be in our executive remuneration and, you know, short-term incentives and all of that because, you know, we know the challenge is that there's so many egos and money-centric players that you know if you're if you're incentivizing them to do the same that they've always always done then you know like you say we're never going to get anything different so yeah. I don't know I mean I think as a start we should be putting everything in our business models with a number on that says excluding the cost of nature you know when yeah. you put a little asterisk and says oh yeah. this is excluding GST I think or sales tax we could put excluding cost of nature <laughs> I agree with you. I mean, I think that's brilliant. And, and, and I think it's, it's extremely critical to underscore that point, because I think a lot of people, yeah, it feels like when, when folks enter into this conversation of, okay, but, but how does that, how does that look? What do I do? Right. And then, and then it, it kind of gets to the point of like, okay, but what's the report I can produce? What's the data I can enter? What's the analysis that I can provide? Um, and the truth is, um, it starts by asking the question, right? And, and I think I think people, um, a lot of people in our community are, are very eager to get involved and take action and, and do something right away, like go to their office and, and make make the change. Um, and, and the truth is, which is one of the reasons why we provide, for example, the Game Changer Intensive is, is that, 
you know, you have to, you have to take a step back first and, and make sure that you are actually, actually asking all of the questions and thinking about it from a, mm -hmm. a an informed lens. And it's not, and, and simply bringing the topic up is taking action, right? In fact, your, mm -hmm. your, your, your comment about adding the asterisks to the bottom of the, of the financial report, you know, the CEO is going to look at, look at that. And, and, and that, that response of like, what does that even mean? Is is yeah. literally going to start a chain reaction. Yeah. That's gonna that, that's gonna result in a series of people act just asking the question and and yeah. pondering the idea. So I love that. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Ingrid. Well, and I love what Liz Farr also put in the chat. She said the egos prefer to do the same thing they've always done, even if it doesn't work, to trying something new that might work. Yeah. So and just recognizing that these changes start within each of us. That when it comes to making the big changes, and it's not just nature, it's also humanity, humans mm -hmm. being part of nature, we are part of these ecosystems. But the way that over the last several thousand years, humans have more and more started to try to dominate over nature, creating this human supremacy over the planet, which is not effective because we're out of balance. So what does it look like to have humans become part of our ecosystems again? And to put that collaboration, that symbiosis first, mm -hmm. and that change begins within each of us and looking at the bigger equations, yeah. because it's not all about money and finance, Yeah, yeah. really looking so. at our financial choices and our business choices, and even our personal consumer choices yeah. of yeah. The, the goods and services we're buying and asking ourselves, Who's actually paying for this? Because the price does not represent what it took to get to me. Who pays? Yeah, yeah. The yeah. planet is paying. People being um, marginalized and exploited are paying for this. And then who's benefiting? Who's mm -hmm. actually benefiting from me yeah. purchasing this? Sure, I may benefit a bit for a little while, but how long before it goes in the trash because of yeah. planned obsolescence? Who's yeah. actually benefiting who decides who's making the decisions around all of these systems and who can create justice? Mm -hmm. How do we shift all of this? And some of those things don't get adequately represented on our financial statements. They mm -hmm. can't yet. And adding some lines so that we're at least expressing, asking the questions is a good, you know, in our Jedi conversations, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, one of the big questions we have is, equity it's on the balance sheet how do we make equity equitable <laughs> let's start having this conversation how do we reconcile all of this it's right there built into the language that we are using already to just open up these conversations and it starts by each of us looking within ourselves and so looking at this from that international perspective of what can each of us do join the conversation and recognizing that here, Accounting Alchemy Network, here we are having this conversation. You're in Australia. Matthew and I are both on the West Coast of the United States. And we would love to have more voices in this room. We set up the Accounting Alchemy Network as a decentralized leadership model to create a space where people can step forward and get the support each of us need in being the change we want to see in the world and not have to necessarily ask for permission that we're all on the same Play, playing toward a bigger picture goal and trying to get our egos out of the way to ask these questions and creating this movement and wanting to do it together. Mm -hmm. So inviting people in to join this conversation is a really great first step. Yeah, if I can add also to what you said um, in response to Lizzie's question there around, um, you know, people don't want to change, even if it might be something that might work. You know, I would su I would suggest, if you can, to take extrapolate the 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 thing as it is for the next five years and say, if we keep going down this path, it's going to lose us revenue, customers, brand reputation, whatever, whatever. Like, try and show that if we don't make a change it's actually going to cost us more than if we do make the change i mean maybe she's already doing that but it might just be something that could work i don't know you've got to keep trying i think that's the point that matthew was making even if we can't create visible change i think challenging 
and putting the question out there does start to get the cogs turning maybe in a different way going, ah, oh, that's mm. interesting. Mm. And and show benchmarks, show other companies doing it differently. I mean, whether you like it or not, that Apple advert where they had nature come into the boardroom, I mean, that that was quite polarizing, but I actually think that's positive because it gets people thinking about nature and the whole nested system that we're in. You know, mm. I talk about that in my papers because I didn't learn about whole systems thinking. Like mm. I left school in 1986. I went off and did my professional exams in 2001. I never even thought about the system that I operated in and nothing was taught to me about it. Mm. So it's, you know, okay, maybe it's not my fault that I didn't realize, but I suddenly woke up to the fact that I'm in a system. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So we have another question from Jason and I want to read that because we're coming up on time. And, and then after we hear a, your response, I want to make sure we get the titles of these, these green papers that you've been referencing because I want to make sure people know where those are. So Jason says, and I apologize if I pronounce this last name incorrectly, but Alan Savory posits that individuals have a great deal of common sense. All that common sense evaporates in the context of organizations or institutions because the life of that org or institution is at risk. How do you think we can shift this? Paula, over to you. Yeah, I think this goes back to my comment about the CEO that was lying in the boardroom. Mm. I feel like it's our responsibility. Like I can't remember um, who said it, but the standard we walk past is the standard that we accept. So. I think we have to go into our organizations with a little bit more um, standing a little bit upright and say, you know, we we've got this and we need to make change and and try and find the pockets of light within the organization that actually are with you. So if the CEO is not with you and the leadership team aren't with you, then find find the people that are with you you know, outside of finance, inside of finance, wherever they might be, find them. And like um, Ingrid was saying, you know, try and get the 3% out of your organization that actually cares about this. And all the leadership schools are telling the CEOs to listen to your people. So, you know, if they are, if they do care about that and more people are caring about that, then then we've got a right and an and a opportunity to to start shifting and bringing in our common sense. Because even the CEO's got common sense um, most of the time. But, yeah, you know, I can think of a few people that don't. But most of the CEOs have have got, an, you know, some idea of common sense. Um, so how do we appeal to that yeah. and try and depersonalize it from, look, you know, our business is doing the wrong thing here. How do we change that? How do we? And I think it is a real risk of viability. Like, I really truly believe in the next five to ten years we're going to have consumers and investors walking away from businesses that are not doing the right thing. I love yeah. seeing the clapping hands and hearts floating up the side of the screen as people are like, yes, preach. Well, I just want to, I want to, I want to pinpoint what you said, because I want to make sure I heard it correctly. Cause I think if I heard it correctly, it's a brilliant statement. And that is um, the standard that you walk past is the standard that you accept. Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah, and it's a, it was an army general. I think it might be an American army general. I can't remember. It's either an Australian army general or American. But yeah, yeah. standard yeah. you walk past is the standard you accept. Yeah. No, I, 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 like, I deeply appreciate that. And, and it's ironic that you bring up possibility that it might be an American general because the, the thing that kind of immediately comes to mind is the, like the concept of... Um, collateral damage right it's like oh uh, you know you, you win some you lose some right like these these sort of attitudes of of cutthroat um capitalist business that that allow for us to be like yeah okay whatever just walk past because we're going to make money over here we're fine you know so that and, and now we're changing that we're saying we're saying no 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 you, you know don't tolerate that behavior so well, anyways you know i want to um, add one little thing to that yeah, really yeah. quick just understanding also but it depends on how it's impacting us directly or indirectly, mm -hmm. because we won't put up with certain standards when they're happening overseas, but we'll put up with them here when they might be benefiting or not impacting, or we don't want to rock the boat where we are. One mm -hmm. example of this being Nazi Germany, people mm -hmm. stood up and said, uh-uh, that's not okay. Holocaust, this is, this is a no-go. And having recently seen the film Origin, which is based on Isabel Wilkerson's book Cast, she demonstrates 
how the legal system in Nazi Germany was based upon the United States Jim Crow laws. And those things were still happening here. And that is what inspired Nazi Germany was United States legal systems. And we would put up with it here, but we would go to war with somebody else who's pulling that. So yeah. looking at what we're willing to walk past, and sometimes it's a question of how close it is to us and whether we feel threatened by it directly or indirectly. So yeah. thank you for bringing that up. It's giving me goosebumps. Yeah, it's a it's a great book to read. Um, and uh, yeah, that's an amazing. And, and yeah, I remember reading that book and seeing that. I'm like, okay, wait a second. That's a little bit of a mind blowing mic drop moment for a lot of people who don't know that that about our American history. So, um, anyway, so we are coming up on the back end. I want to make sure I see you put those those <laughs> green paper links in the chat. So tell us what those green papers are, so we all know, and then yeah. and then we'll make yeah. sure that we can put that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the first the first one I wrote um, about a year ago now was very much an introduction. So this audience might think, oh yeah, well, I kind of know these concepts, but it was aimed at the finance professional that doesn't know about this. I didn't want to change people that already are on the path to a new dimension and a new um, paradigm. I wanted to try and get the people that aren't on that path yet. So this is an introduction to um, stewardship, to nested systems, to caritas, which is a beautiful word about having care in your business. And it's about examples around the world of businesses doing things differently. So that was the first paper. And then the second paper was more about the business model. So diving in and there's lots of really good questions in there. So people might find it useful to take some of those questions and ask themselves and their businesses those questions and took the work of um, the guy from the IMF, um, Shamney, about the, the cost of a whale and the value that a whale brings about the carbon um, sequestration that it has and how we don't value elephants and whales in our balance sheets. And so there's there's some really nice examples in that. Um, so yeah, they're kind of fun, informative um, papers that I don't think are challenging to read. Um, so yeah, there are links there. Um, you just need to give me your details in on my website and then you kind of get the papers and and um, you know, get into my EDMs as well. If if that's not um, you know something that you want to do, then you can obviously unsubscribe after you get the green papers. I won't take offense. Yeah, um, I promise. I know, right? You get that unsubscribe notification. You're like, Sorry. where is that? And why do they hate me? I know. <laughs> what did I do wrong? wrong? Exactly. <laughs> but they don't. It's all good. Anyways, all right. So we are in the final minute or two. Um, so, um, any final thought you just want to put on the table or last thought and then, and then conclude that with how do people find you and get, get a hold of you? Yeah. Yeah. So final thoughts, gosh, you know, I mean, it's, we don't need a mindset shift, but I think we need to, to be brave in our journey and to continue to be inspired to do different and to challenge differently. Um, and so hopefully this will give you that um, that sort of response to go, there's other people in the world that are doing challenging things. So I would say, imagine when you've only got, like you're on your deathbed and you think, gosh, I could have made all of that change. And when you turn 50, if anyone hasn't turned 50, I, I promise you it happens because you think I've only got a finite amount of time left to make a change, to make a difference. And that's driving me. So if you're listening to this, watching this, what does it take for you to make a difference? And just think about that. I don't want to be on my deathbed and think, I wish I'd done more. Not worked more, but I wish I'd done more, you know? And I think this work brings me a lot of joy and yeah. hanging out with people who get it, but also educating those that don't. I thought that brings me a lot of joy too. So people can find me on pkadvisory.com.au, on LinkedIn, please reach out and connect with me. I'm also in the Alchemy Network as well. So I'll try and post things in that um, when I'm posting things um, so that you get to share as well and if anyone else is interested I know that they're quite late at night at the moment but I also hold a future finance thinkers lab where we're challenging the questions like you know how does it what does it take to get the planetary risk into our balance sheets and all sorts of difficult questions there's such great yeah. conversations I highly recommend them and <laughs> It was so worth staying up till midnight. Now that the time has shifted, I don't know I if know. 2 a.m. is quite I as know. global, but I'm going to try. You know what? <laughs> but you know what? I feel like if there's enough people on a different time zone, I'm happy to run two, 
you know, consecutive because we just need to talk more because when you're yeah. talking, all of these great ideas came. That idea about the weighted average cost of capital came to me three weeks ago. Ingrid was there when we were talking about it and just, you know, we just channel things through when we get excited and we're talking to people who get and I want to make a difference. Yes. Well, and with that, r right back for any Aussies, Kiwis, <laughs> anyone from anywhere all over the world, please join us at accountingalchemy.net and join these conversations. And when we have leaders who want to step forward and lead things in other time zones, um, we are happy to help make that happen. So let's get a global dialogue going and really bring accountants and other financial professionals from all over the world together to make this change. Thanks so much to everyone watching live and the replay, and we'll see you in these conversations in the LinkedIn and Facebook groups. Have Thanks a great everyone. day, everyone.